So our project was for South Fork Design Group. Um, I'm Chris McLeod. This is Bonnie McDougall, Chris Young, and Dallin Fairbanks. Um, and uh, South Fork Design Group is a company that was started by Bonnie's dad, Ray. Um, and it's all about designing uh, structures for commercial and residential uh, spaces. So for example, if you wanted, if your, I guess your family was getting bigger, bigger or your business was getting bigger or your wallet's just getting bigger and you want to you know, build a big house or a nice office, then you would come to Bonnie's dad and you would design a, a, a brand new space. So this is an example of a house that they have recently designed, and as you can tell, it's very nice. Um, uh, they also make 3D models, so you come to them and they design it, and they'll make a 3D model so you can see what your house looks like, um, and you can kind of explore all of the options of what you want before you build it, so you can it looks make sure that it'll look exactly like you want it to. Um, South Fork Design Group was started in 2006 by Bonnie's dad, all by himself. Uh, he just worked by himself, um, but slowly it's grown a little bit. Um, so now he has uh, five draftsmen that help him design. So people will come into his business, um, they'll talk to the draftsmen, the draftsmen will help design, and now Ray works as the engineer. So after the draftsmen kind of go through an initial design, they'll go to Ray um, and kind of go over, and he'll go over the designs. And then he also has now hired an office manager which they're kind of in between office managers right now, so the office manager helps them kind of keep everything in order. So the biggest problem that South Fork is dealing with right now is data. They don't have any data tracking, well, they do have data, but they don't have an effective means of tracking and storing and then reading data to make informed business decisions. For example, Ray has been, for basically since the inception of the company using square footage to estimate um, labor hours in the design and just multiplying those labor hours by a fixed hourly rate for each designer and that's how he's been determining cost. But he's found that for some projects, maybe there are projects with an external covered deck or with other features of the building that make it more complicated and require more time. So he's found that square footage isn't a good estimate of cost or effort in a project. And one of the big problems with that is that's also how he determines bonuses for the employees. So if the employees complete the project under the budgeted hours, they get a bonus. So he's found that he's giving away a lot of money and bonuses on projects that maybe were easier, and he's taking on projects that maybe aren't as economically rewarding as he'd like. So he basically, he wants data to make better business decisions about what kind of projects he should take, how much he should charge for each product, and how to reward <coughs> his uh, draftsmen for their work. And we evaluated the basically feasibility of restructuring their system and creating better data storage and uh, a system interface <coughs> on three levels on economic feasibility on organizational feasibility and technical feasibility. On the economic side, we found that it was highly feasible based on the hours we anticipate it would take to build the system um, to help store the data for South Fork. We came up with a total cost of $2,240 and compared to South Fork's 2018 net income, which was $115,000, and we find that they definitely have the funds necessary to make this change. In addition, like I mentioned, this project will help them take on more profitable projects in the future, which will increase revenue, and it will decrease the amount they're spending um, to pay draftsmen for their bonuses, because we'll have better metrics for gauging employee performance. And then on the <coughs> technical and organizational side of things, we found that it would be technically feasible as well as our team would be the team behind designing the MVC web app where they would do most of their reporting and where they would store things to the database. And it, because of our classes, we're familiar with MVC frameworks and database design. So we have the skills necessary to design the system that we think would help the company. Uh, the greatest issue would be cybersecurity as we don't have a lot of experience with that. At this point, Ray's company is pretty small, and so we don't have 
a lot of fear that some big skilled hackers are going to come in. But um, on the long term, if race company is going to expand, that's something that they'd have to invest time and resources in in the future to make sure it's secure. And then for organizational feasibility, we found that the biggest issue would just be if the company isn't accurately storing the data that they find. So if we spend all the time and effort to install this new system and design it so that they can read data and use it to make better decisions, if they're not inputting accurate data, it's not going to help them and it's just going to be a huge waste of money. But we think that if we design the database and the MVC web app well, they're not going to be able to input very much erroneous data and it should be pretty manageable. So we've, overall, we found this project should be very feasible. Right, so like Dallin and Chris talked about, this is the main process of software <coughs> design. A client will contact the office manager via email or phone and set up an appointment with a draftsman. They'll then talk about specific requirements and features that they would like for their residential or commercial building. Um, the draftsman will then go model that and determine a bid price. If the client accepts that bid price, they'll make a deposit and the draftsman will continue to model and send the draft to Ray for structural engineering and making sure that the, everything's looking good as far as foundation wise. Um, <clears throat> that's then sent back to the client and they make their final deposit and the office manager removes that from the spreadsheet and it just cycles over that with every client they have. Um, this is a screenshot of Toggle, an application they use for time tracking um, to, for employees to clock in and clock out and record their hours. This is one of their current um, systems that they're using. Uh, they also use Microsoft Excel to track their current projects, which has worked for them these past 12 years, but is not ideal, so, which is why we'd like to implement a centralized database to kind of manage all their data. They also use Square, uh, an invoicing, financial invoicing application where they can send invoices to customers and it saves their payment information and it's a third party site so they don't have to do any you know, security details on it, it's just all managed through this application. Um, we also created a data flow diagram. This is their context level of how data is passed through the system. Um, we've kind of talked a little bit about this already, but we also have a level zero. And as you can see, um, there's just all these different applications for Microsoft Excel to track projects, and Toggle to record employee hours, and Square to track finances. And we like to at least merge two of these into a centralized database so that Ray will be a better able to track his data and make more informed business decisions along with some various level one diagrams of logging in to and paying bonuses and counting, recording employee hours and such like that. Um, from our analysis, we determined that the three main areas for improvement are first off tracking data, right? Because currently Ray would like to expand his business, but um, Toggle through a, the time tracking software only allows five free users without having to upgrade to a plan and spending a big chunk of money to record more hours for an increased number of employees. So we'd like to build a feature that would allow employees to clock in, clock out, and record their hours. As well as <coughs> um, bonuses, right? Like Dallin said, um, year to date, Ray has already paid over $4,000 in bonuses, and that's solely based upon being under hours under budgeted hours for projects. Um, and as Dallin mentioned, there is a more efficient way to do that based on employee efficiency and employee profitability in working on their drafts and finishing those on hard projects that have increased features and make it harder to finish under hours. But Ray doesn't have the data to track those cost drivers, even though he suspects there are additional cost drivers so we'd like to build a centralized database to help him accomplish that. So um, basically what we're proposing to do is kind of what we've been working on in 403 this whole semester. 
um, basically an MVC app that is attached to a database. So to start, this is the ERD that uh, we drew up for the new database. Um, the projects table, as you can see, is very big. And the reason being is because we asked my dad all of the different things that he has, he has seen that take longer on projects, things that can't be cost drivers. And so all of the cost driver fields are within that. We also have the employees table and the clients table, and then just a few lookup tables to help keep the data integrity. Um, the class diagram is pretty similar. Uh, the difference being that we have getters and setters and the methods and then all the attributes. We keep that as private to help with data security. And um, on top of that, we have our sequence diagram. We base the sequence diagram off of like a main system, the project system, and then everything works off of the sequence diagram. And our last one, well, we have two, I guess. So we have, here's our context level diagram, and then uh, the zero, the level zero diagrams, if you can see, it's a lot simpler than the other one was, a lot smaller, just because you're working with a more centralized system. And this will add a lot of value to this company because it's helping them to utilize their data to make better business decisions. Um, not lose as much money, especially like sometimes they'll set a bid for a project and they'll set the bid way low just because they, they only have the one cost driver. But if they have the additional cost drivers, then they're getting fair bids for their projects, they're getting their, their, like, the real value out of the project, and they're also saving money on the bonuses that they're rewarding to their employees. And then the final part of our project was we just wanted to, because all these technical changes, Ray, Bonnie's dad is not really gonna understand a lot of like the things that we've, the charts we've made and different things. So we wanted to create some user interface designs of what this might end up looking like. And so we just have like some screenshots of what it might look like with the data of tracking the hours and just some easy summary data that will help uh, Ray visualize the changes that we made. And also on the next slide, this is for the draftsmen, kind of what they'll be able to see with their projects and kind of their productivity to hold them accountable and also a way for them to clock in and out as we talked about. Um, the office manager being able to keep track of everything and manage the projects. Um, an option to create the projects, keep everything. So this makes sure that they input all the data that we want to track to be able to understand the cost drivers. Um, and be able to view the projects and see how everything's going if you want to see all of those fields um, and be able to view all the past projects and current projects and kind of how they are doing um, with those then also this is just another view expanded view of employees that Ray can see to track his employees and their pro productivity and uh, just kind of more information about his employees and then just some financial analysis too so all of this is just to help him kind of view the data and understand the data um, but we think that the UI designs are going to be super helpful for him to actually visualize the changes that we've made. Um, this is just kind of a project plan of how, how long it might take to implement this. Um, we kind of talked about like designing and we've already uh, got some ideas going around of how this might be implemented and we think that it can be done relatively quickly and uh, very feasible. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you.
So we did our, our project on Bit49, and we'll talk a little bit more about who they are. But for those who don't know us, my name is Jacoby. I'm Andre. I'm Will. And I'm Spencer. And since every team needs a little catchy thing for you to remember us, our initials spell JAWS, and we thought that was important. So. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of background on Bit49. Um, <clears throat> so they're a, uh, a cryptocurrency mining service. And so um, <clears throat> what happens is clients can pay Bit49 uh, to host, so basically provide electricity to these right uh, mining rigs, uh, which are machines that um, mine cryptocurrency. Um, they're a small, small startup, uh, kind of based out of the Provo area. Some BYU grads started it. Um, and they have mining locations or uh, big warehouses where they hook, where they have these machines um, in both Russia and Colorado. <clears throat> so a client can, can buy these mining rigs uh, either on their own or through Bit49, um, and Bit49's main service is just to provide electricity at a certain wattage um, so that these computers can run. <clears throat> And uh, one of their main goals as a company is to um, make the most high-performing, reliable, and user-friendly <coughs> mining solutions possible. So cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency mining is kind of uh, a new concept, kind of foreign concept to most people. So we wanted to do a, a short little activity to kind of explain kind of what mining is, what Bit, uh, Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrency mining is. So if everybody, uh, you can use uh, your head, paper, calculator, or whatever, but we want you guys to solve this equation. And then just raise your hand when, you, when you're when done. Raise your hand when you're done. All right, Mason, what's your answer? 76. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> <Those are> close. <laughs> mining works is that uh, they're, they're taking away, a, so banks and governments are usually ones who authorize transactions when they make a transaction. Uh, so uh, basically networks of computers, all these computers, solve complicated math algorithms to 
uh, validate a transaction when it's made online. And so that's what these mining rigs do, is they're solving math equations uh, to verify transactions um, when it's done with a cryptocurrency. So um, as far as Bit49 structure goes, um, <clears throat> they have uh, a few employees. Most of them uh, are BYU students, actually. Uh, most of them are pretty young. And when we worked with them, when we did our interviews uh, with our, our uh, solution, as you'll see later, uh, we worked mostly with uh, the, the C-suite employees as well as these uh, technical operations analysts. So we mostly worked with Felipe and uh, Cody. Okay, so some of the main problems that we identified with working with Bit49 through our interviews is that they face a lot of the problems that lots of small startups and smaller companies face. Um, namely, they're sort of trying to use some cost-saving methods um, in all their operations. And so they use a lot of independent services for all their various tasks, right? They're using Asana, they're using Zendesk, and they're using lots of different things uh, to try and use the free versions as much as they can before they have to build up to another service. And so right now they don't have one unified source for all their information, for all their data. The next thing that we also notice is when they're logging a lot of this information about customer purchases and transactions and problems and repairs, they're recording everything just in Google Drive and Google Sheets, uh, which is probably better than a filing cabinet, but it's still, uh, these, these Google Sheets take forever to load whenever they pull them up. They're not a very reliable source, and so everyone just has access to these sheets and can accidentally delete a formula or delete a, an equation and throw off <laughs> the, the integrity of all their data. And lastly, there's not a real customer interface that's been created for customers to be able to react and respond to Bit49, um, respond with Bit49 employees in regards to their machines ticketing requests or to see the performance of their machines. There's a, an interface that exists now, but it's not built for customers and it's not very intuitive. And so here's just a quick uh, overview of the different um, systems that we were looking at. Um, as you can see, there's just some Google, some Google uh, sheets and things on here. If you go through, you can see some of them pop up. But essentially, that's, this is how they store all their data in Google Sheets and GitHub. And, um, and so that, that's one of the main problems that we want to help them fix. Yeah, so among all of these different issues that we identified, um, we wanted to narrow it down into something more manageable that we could propose solutions for. So for our project scope, we decided we needed to come up with some kind of centralized database to manage all of these independent services and then propose um, some sort of computing, um, computing platform that they could use to host all of their, their data. And along with that, um, because Bit49 is kind of small, it has um, a little bit less technical expertise, we would need to um, talk about potentially getting a software team who could who would have the capacity to develop um, this kind of functionality, and also be able to develop um, a interface system or a dashboard that the users um, and the different clients could to could look at to be able to respond to the different changes that are being made um, with the hosting services. As well as with these new changes, the hope is that um, more clients, they'll onboard more clients, which means that they would need to have more customer support. Um, so for the project feasibility, um, as you can see from up here, the one that we wanted to focus on the most was the technical feasibility, which is um, medium to high risk. And as I mentioned before, this is mostly because Bit49 is a small company. A lot of their um, hires are out of, cur are currently in college, and so um, they don't have a lot of technical expertise. And to build something like a centralized database that has um, an interface system is somewhat complex, so they would need to hire um, a team of developers. And so that would, that would be the necessary step in order to mitigate this kind of risk because currently, Bit49 wouldn't be able to handle um, something to that level. All right, so for our proposal, mostly it's, um, like you said, we're gonna, we wanna create a web application that will have a dashboard and show other information that we have up here, like machine details, configuration, down machines, and uh, tickets they open, support tickets, so they can get their machines back up and running if there are any issues. Um, and then here are all the data sources where we get that from. So here's the context diagram of the new data flow. Um, everything would be going in and out of the web application. You can see the request that the customer would make, would make and it would, it would then go to all these other entities. Um, 
one really important thing we thought is whenever a customer creates a support ticket, the problem is, is these uh, these mining rigs can go down pretty easily sometimes, and customers aren't very happy about that because when the machines are down, they're not mining and they're not getting Bitcoin like they want to, and that's not good. Um, so they'll, they'll create support tickets, and sometimes there's a pretty uh, big lag time between when the machine's actually down and it is able to get fixed by on-site technicians. And so one big thing we thought uh, was important is whenever a customer did create a ticket uh, to fix machines that the on-site technicians in Russia or Colorado would also be notified of that, of that issue. Um, and then the rest of this is pretty much things that were already being done, but just all in one centralized location rather than all, all these different Google Sheets and uh, other places in the world. And then here's the, the new, they don't have any databases set up, so with the database, they have an ERD to show the relationships between certain tables. At this point, not super complex. I'm sure it would become more and more complex, but this is just a baseline. And these are all stored on separate Google Sheets and different websites. Yeah, currently. Really cool. Look at All right, so we have a prototype for the web application. Um, so yeah, we can assume that when they when they come to the application, they have a login. They come and log in. Sometimes you're just logged in, as you can see. Um, and then yeah, they just have a dashboard where they can see the performance of their mining rigs. And then on the next screen, they can see more details about their different machines. And they can go to configuration, configure their machines, and then see a list of currently unavailable or down machines. And then from here, they can either create tickets or they can go to tickets and see their currently open tickets and create a ticket and then take it. Um, yeah, and like, like we mentioned uh, at the beginning, one of the major goals of Bit49, um, and this is a quote from the, the CEO, is to make the most high-performing, reliable, and user-friendly mining solutions possible. Um, their, their goal is to really become a world leader um, in this field. Um, and in the current system, we, we, we see that it's really hard to, to scale to, to be a world leader and to really have that user-friendliness that they want as a, as a world leader in the mining uh, industry. And so um, this proposed solution will um, not only meet their, their goals for uh, user friendliness, but also scalability as a company. They'll be able to grow uh, at a much faster pace than Google Sheets currently allows them to do, and the current system allows them to do. So. Welcome to our presentation today. Um, we are going to be talking about Freshline. It's a digital marketing company uh, based out in Lehigh, Utah. And we're going to be doing an analysis on their product management. Uh, Freshline is currently and just finished its Series A round of funding. And so it's growing really fast from a startup to just a well-established, uh, fast-growing company. They have about 50 to 100 employees, and they're based out in Lehigh, Utah, in the heart of Silicon Slopes. Uh, Freshline is mainly comprised of like uh, their three main um, systems, and their operations, their development, and then their C-suite. And that's who we mainly use, uh, work with um, at the company, is their CEO, Jay Bean, 
and his two predecessors, uh, Craig Miwa and Chris Stevens. Uh, they actually have both worked with Jay Bean on two or three former uh, startup companies. And so the uh, Fresh Slime <coughs> business is very um, startup uh, oriented. But I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our team. I'm going to be giving you just a brief context about the company, and Logan's going to go on, go on and give you a, um, a business case and more detail about why we were there. And then Tyler will take it off to give you more of an analysis of what we did and our proposed solutions, and then Ben will conclude. As I was saying earlier, Freshline is very startup oriented. They tailor their customers to uh, small businesses. And uh, what they mainly focus on is trying to help businesses engage with their customers. And so the main uh, focus of their business is a messaging platform to help initiate that engagement. Awesome. So we spent the majority of our time talking to Josh Solomon, who's the head of product um, he was down here in the left corner of the screen, and um, the, their product development is really broken up into two different phases. Um, he's part of the primary, or the, the first phase, uh, and I'll get into more details with that, but just to give more background on this company, um, Fresh Lime is a customer retention program. Um, they uh, put up chatbots on websites. They help uh, really bridge a gap between uh, a consumer that's becoming more and more um, that takes more and more of a liking to text messages rather than phone calls. Um, just some stats to, to support their business model. 90% um, of consumers now would prefer to text a company rather than call a company. Um, but 91% of companies don't have the capacity to do web chats or web messaging. So there's a real gap and disconnect between um, what consumers are looking for and uh, what companies currently have. So there's a real opportunity to break into this market share. Um, as well with that staggering number, over 180 billion messages are sent every day. Um, it's becoming our new form of primary uh, communication. So Freshline's hoping to break into this space. Um, now they do have some stiff competition, both with local companies uh, and nationwide companies that are working to solve this problem of customer retention through messaging. Um, as Mason said, they're right now going through their, uh, a couple rounds of funding, and so their growth has been exploding. They have over 100 integrations and over 100,000 accounts that are using Freshline. Um, but if they want to stay competitive, uh, both with local companies and nationwide companies, they're going to have to grow uh, exponentially with this funding. Uh, which brings us to our, our business case and what we saw as the overarching problem for Freshline. Um, in speaking with Josh, who's the head of product, there's, there's two phases. How it starts off is the executives brainstorm an idea, they get a high level vision or product that they want to implement into the company. This is then trickled down to the VP of product and product managers who take this high level goal and they box it into uh, a use case narrative, which is just something where they, they write up a situation where someone would be using this product and how it would, uh, would benefit that end user. Um, this serves as a kind of check sheet or uh, requirements for the development team. So as it works its way through the product managers, it's something called the discovery phase or the creating of the actual product narrative. Uh, when it's passed off to the development team, it's called the delivery phase, um, which is where they're actually going to be creating um, the, the product, developing the product. And this is where we have the big uh, breakup between the two. Um, there's no communication from that product. After product sends over their use case or their, um, their development request, there's no communication back to the product manager. Um, this is problematic because product managers don't know what happened to their project, if it was rejected, why it was rejected, and when sponsored uh, executives come asking what happened with their idea, product managers have to dig through backlogs or hunt down dev team members to find out where the project is in the process or why it was rejected. And so this is more of an in-depth look of what Logan was talking about. Um, as he mentioned, there's um, three distinct teams. There's the executives, the product manager, and the development team. 
And uh, as you can see, the development team, I mean, uh, excuse me, the, the product manager will send off a request to the development team, where then it will um, undergo a process, a grooming process is what they call it. And there the projects will be risk ranked and prioritized, and then decided if they'll go on this two week sprint. Um, in this sprint, they try to get as many products um, done as possible, uh, but some do not get complete in this time frame. Uh, in which case, in the current system, this pro um, the product will go back to the top um, to the um, to the um, development team again, where it does the same process: the grooming, um, decide if it's going to go in this two-week sprint, and then repeat as many times as necessary until the project gets done. Um, the second part is once it, a project is finished, it goes to the QA team, where they run the test, um, find if there's any bugs. Um, in this case, if a uh, project is deemed to have bugs and is not passable, it will also go back to the development team and um, they'll fix the bugs, update it as needed, and this process repeats as many times as necessary. So we are, actually want to highlight this. Um, as you can see, there's really no communication in this process between the development team and the product manager. Um, he's not aware of anything that happens, um, all these project failures and reasons for delays. Um, so our new proposed solution, um, and the context level is actually really simple. Um, the only thing different is that now, instead of just a development request going in, there's also a task um, progress report coming back to the product manager. And this on a, on a, a finer scale um, happens like this. Um, so as you can see, when a project isn't finished on time in the, time, in the two week sprint, uh, instead of going directly back to the development team, a report is actually sent to the product manager where he can keep a log and, of the reason for um, delays of this project. Once it's um, gone through the product manager, then it goes back to the development team, and this process will repeat as many times as necessary. Uh, a similar thing happens um, to the QA team. Uh, when they don't pass um, a project because of bugs or other fixes needed, um, a report is also sent to the product manager where he can assess um, the reason why uh, it wasn't, fit, uh, wasn't passed and other data as needed, and then it's sent back to the development team and this process is repeated. Um, so this is actually, this is super crucial because um, with this information, uh, first the product manager will be updated and informed on the status of his projects that uh, he's pushed through, and also in the future he'll be able to make better estimates on similar projects and uh, as far as um, scope, schedule, and resources for, for these different projects that he's going to approve. <coughs> so um, just to kind of continue on what Tyler was talking about, you can tell that the, the product manager, the lack of communication um, with, within Fresh Lime really hurts the product manager. Um, so we talked to Josh a lot, and he told us all about his frustrations of having no idea if, if a project is doing well or not. Um, sometimes the project wasn't even being worked on. It was it had failed and he literally had no idea. So it's impossible for him to know um, when he can start new projects or how he can report um, that information to the executive. So that's with this use case you can see. Um, we added this down here at the bottom. He records, the product manager will record the task completion data and that data can go to the executive so that they can, if they wanna uh, start new projects, um, it makes it possible. Um, and with this, just with our update in the software, um, in terms of like feasibility, economically, it will be uh, very good for FreshLime because it's not gonna be a high cost project. Uh, the software that they use at FreshLime is in-house, and so we recommend them to just use developers that already have familiarity with um, their software. So, it'll, and it's also not a huge project. Really, we just need to change the software so that there is um, just more communication between the three uh, parties. And so, um, as you can see, after we implement these changes, Freshline will be moving fast from a uh, startup to a large company with um, just a great uh, future. So we're excited for them to implement our ideas. Thank you.
did not plan the checkers. Yeah, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> this is business to happen for all of us, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Represent uh, Greenex Pest Control. We were able to work with them over the course of the semester to develop a better system for their rankings um, for all their employees. So, uh, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to go through um, just the background of Greenex, um, what the current situation is, uh, how we can improve it, and our proposed solution, and you'll be able to follow along with this uh, multicolored presentation. So. The very first thing you should know is that Greenex has been around for about six years. They have 11 locations across the country, from Chicago, Detroit, all the way over here to Salt Lake. In the summers, they uh, employ up to 400 uh, pest control technicians. Uh, these are the people with flat brim hats and those nice khaki shorts. Um, and they um, compile their data into different, these different 11 uh, branches, um, and they take the data across all 11 branches and uh, compile them into higher level uh, rankings by which uh, these 400 uh, pest control technicians can receive bonuses, can receive raises of sorts, as, as well as being able to show to uh, the upper level management, to the investors and shareholders, how well Greenix is doing. Um, in addition, uh, Greenix has actually been able to double uh, the amount of customers they've had every summer in the past four summers, and because they see uh, that growth continuing to go on year to year, there is a need for them to upgrade their current system. So, as you can see, there's a couple things going on. Greenix has a huge focus on its employees, and that's the way that they make their money. And their employees want to make more money. And so, Greenix has been trying to recognize their employees for the work that they're doing. The second thing is that they're growing a lot, and so their current systems aren't going to be able to manage what they need. They're, what they're trying to do is uh, find employee statistics from all their different softwares and pull it into one report where they can see exactly who's doing well and reward those employees. So the current solution is you have one employee who gets on his computer and go, logs into each of the four different systems and downloads and exports eight different reports and throws them all into an Excel sheet and then runs analysis on it and then gives that report to his manager. And it can take hours. So what we're proposing is, uh, yeah, you can go, is basically to create something that requires minimal human input and doesn't have a human as the primary mover. See, these, all these different systems have APIs already that can gather the data. So we want to leverage those APIs, put them into a relational database, and then produce real-time metrics so that somebody can log onto the system immediately see exactly what they need to. Um, so economically, they don't have developers in-house right now who can really do it. So we would have to develop, uh, produce a team that can take care of that. So not a whole lot of risk. It, it just takes a little bit of, a little bit of economic effort. Um, technical risk is related to that. And operationally, um, they would be thrilled to have this. Any, anything is better than the situation that they have right now. So the, the solution that we propose is basically to use the APIs to automatically retrieve the data, store it in an AWS resource, and then create a simple website where management can go on and find all the rankings that they need. Great. So to go over the current system a little bit, some of the metrics that they're using to rank their employees are, are the ones on the screen. Um, jobs per hour is pretty simple. It's how many jobs does a technician complete in, in an hour. Um, annualized cancel rate is how many customers are canceling their account um, after a certain technician has serviced that account, um, and then multiply by 12 to show what percentage of your customer pool would be gone at the end of the year if you didn't add more accounts. Reservice rate, Greenix offers free reservices if a customer is dissatisfied with the service that they receive. Um, so that counts negatively towards an employee if they do a bad job, then Greenix wants to know how many of their customers are having to be reserviced um, after they do after they do the pest control. Customer feedback score is just that. It's a zero to ten scale of how 
how satisfied was the customer with the technician that day, and sales revenue generated is how, ma how many dollars of accounts um, that the service technician will add. That typically comes from adding an additional service, upgrading the service that a customer already has. And completion rate is a branch level metric that shows the pace of the branch, whether they're going to complete all of the scheduled jobs for the month or if they're behind or ahead of, of that schedule. So here's a data flow diagram of how the system currently works to gather all of that data to produce those metrics. Um, as you can see, there are four different softwares, the main driver being the scheduling software that has the most reports. Um, each of these data flows is a CSV. It's downloaded from that third-party um, software that they subscribe to and then pasted into the processing system, which is an Excel template um, that does all those calculations. And then it spits out a PDF report um, that is sent out to the entire company of which, which professionals are ranked where and how they're doing on those, on those metrics. So here's a more visual representation of that same thing. It's the different softwares that they're using all put into Excel with one guy doing all of the moving and the copying and pasting. This activity diagram shows um, the process that this systems analyst goes through, this operational analyst, um, to produce these rankings. It's kind of small, so you won't be able to read it, but basically you can see that there are six, six reports that he does at once. Um, the order of them doesn't matter, just going to different tabs and downloading them, and then one by one sequentially dropping them into the Excel sheet and running um, the rankings, as they're called. For context, this Excel sheet, um, I'd never seen one at that big in my life. It has 43 different worksheet tabs, and uh, one of these reports can get up to 170,000 rows. So this Excel document typically takes at least seven minutes just to calculate when you change one cell, um, and frequently will time out and break. Um, but then it magically comes back. So it's a very fragile process um, that Misa is going to talk about. I would like to go over six main areas of improvement for the current rankings uh, calculation process. So number one is obviously the room for human error because the operations analyst has to manually input, copy and paste multiple reports into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, the operations analyst also has to manually type in the completion report into the uh, Excel spreadsheet. So that causes a very high percentage or a high um, possibility of having some type, sort of error within the calculation. Uh, number two would be the dependency on the analyst's computer capability. Um, the analyst has to run all those multiple softwares at the same time and that requires a lot of RAM. So that there's also a high possibility that the Excel spreadsheet will crash or the analyst's entire computer could crash. The current process also requires files of different sizes and types to be consolidated, whereas if all that information were consolidated in the first place and in the same source, that would make the process a lot more efficient. Um, this operations analyst that performs this calculation has the administrative access to all of the software, has the administrative access to the HR software, the CRM software, the customer software, the rankings, everything. And so if this one analyst's uh, credentials were to be compromised, then the entire company's information would also be uh, compromised. Um, the metrics of this current system, uh, the current data that comes in is about two days old, and the company is requesting to have a system that will allow real-time metrics so that they can have a current snapshot of the company's service provider standings. And lastly, the amount of time that it takes to perform the calculation, it takes up a lot of time for this operational analyst every single day to perform this calculation in the um, Excel spreadsheet that we have. And so, McKay will go over our proposed solution, which should help to alleviate a lot of those issues that I just so to display our system, we chose not to use a data flow diagram because the data flow is pretty much the same both before and after we have implemented our process. Using a sequence diagram, um, so we can see here that the operations analyst has less um, input into the system per se. Most everything is now automated. 
by a new report system where it loops through each individual um, report on one database, compiles the information from another database, and then compiles everything into one report that is then turned over to um, the operations analyst. And this solves a security problem because he's not going out and directly accessing every single one um, of those databases through um, a login portal. Um, it also cleans up um, the report runtime. Just think about, again, those 107,000, 170,000 uh, rows within Excel. If all that is on um, your, your clipboard on your machine, you know, it's gonna bog down how quickly you can copy, paste, and move things into one consolidated report. So um, automation is, is the main uh, focus and feature of this system. It's what we're striving for, and we believe that Greenix is going to love um, um, the format that we've chosen for them. Um, Grant's gonna talk a little bit about how we're gonna implement that system. Okay. Yes, and <clears throat> the first thing I'm gonna do is let Misa show our diet, our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our mock-ups, yeah. Okay, so this is just a simple mock-up of probably a login screen that certain employees can have access to, they can log in, and mock-up. So this is just a simple mock-up of what it could look like. This contains all of the reports that we discussed earlier, all the eight different reports, and also a dashboard, and um, so that they can visually see all the information and also see the rankings. So as far as getting started, we'll start with basically uh, from the ground up, we want to make sure that we have all of our data organized. We'll start with the database. Um, we'll start by, we'll next go into getting all the back data from each, uh, from each system so that it can be populated. And then we'll finally go into creating a front-facing dashboard and then running final testing on it. <coughs> So we're excited to implement this, uh, this solution, and we think that it'll really provide a lot of value for Greenlix. So, we get started. Thank you. Here to talk about Utah Refugee Connection. I'm Emmett. We have Paige, uh, Spencer, and Matt. And we're going to start off by showing a little video to give some context about how Utah Refugee Connection was started. doing something close to home, in your own community, where you will find people who need help in adapting to their new circumstances. Like countless thousands before them, this will be a period, we hope a short period in their lives. Some of them will go on to be Nobel laureates, public servants, physicians, scientists, musicians, artists, religious leaders, and, and contributors in other fields. Indeed, many of them were these things before they lost everything. This moment does not define them, but our response will help define us. Millions of refugees worldwide whose stories no longer make the news are still in desperate need of help. You might help resettle refugees, learn their host country language, update their work skills, or practice job interviewing. You could offer to mentor a family or a single mother as they transition to an unfamiliar culture, even with something as simple as accompanying them to the grocery store or to school. Some wards and states have existing trusted organizations to partner with, and according to your circumstances, you can give to the church's extraordinary humanitarian effort. Okay, so Utah Refugee Connection was founded in 2009, but it wasn't until um, Elder Keaton gave this talk um, in 2016 that they were able to gain funding and support from 
local government officials and the church, um, which provided a lot of funding. Currently, Utah Refugee Connection has four employees. They log tens of thousands of volunteer hours, and their main goal of what they do is um, provide cleaning supplies, home supplies, and other basic needs for refugees. And the way that a refugee can receive these supplies and goods is through attending classes to help them become more self-sufficient in the community, including English classes, typing classes, um, resume and job building um, classes as well. So we're gonna be talking about this whole system. Okay, so in our analysis, we identified two systems um, that really need change within Utah Refugee Connection. The first system is the donation system, um, where donors will come into the share house and um, donate goods for the refugees. And then the second system <coughs> is the refugee information system. When refugees come to the share house um, with their course information and they uh, come to get their missions and um, all this information is uh, kind of transferred into the system in ways that really need to be changed. So the first part is uh, we conducted a feasibility analysis of these two systems. Um, we really want to rework both of the systems because um, of the nature they only have four employees and they're serving uh, many refugees and they need to they want to serve more. Um, so the first part is technical feasibility. Uh, we included a little meme here. Unfortunately, uh, Utah Refugee Connection does not have the technical capability to uh, build the system. So we, we recommend them to hire a third party um, to build the system for them. Um, we put it as a medium risk just because um, their employees are technologically illiterate. And so if there were problems with the program in the future, they rely heavily on IT support and upon the company who, they, um, who built it for them. The economic feasibility, so currently one of the employees spends 10 to 15 to 20 hours a week um, working with the, the information that is given through paper sheets and whatnot. And they have a budget of $6,000 to incorporate um, a new electronic version in our proposed system, and we believe that within five to 11 months, we'll be able to break even on the $6,000 saved in employee wages. As far as organizational feasibility, um, we do have it as a medium because like Matt said, they are technologically not able to do it themselves, but they are definitely willing and really want the solution. We've been working with Ann Parks who does most of the analysis and the gathering of the data, and she is really excited for a system that involves less of her and more audit. Okay, so um, like we talked about before, there are two systems that we want to work with um, in the current system, and the first one is the refugee information system. So um, when the refugee comes into the share house, they bring with them a paper form that is signed from the courses that they have gone to, and that is the um, evidence uh, that the system administrator uses to um, give them the information. And so if it's their first time in the share house, they will also fill out a paper form that has their information on it. And this paper form will then be um, transferred by hand into the Google Sheets um, that have uh, been used for a long time and are very full of information. Um, and so the data going into the system is the uh, refugee core sheet and the um, refugee personal information that is given on the paper forms, as well as the supply request that is all put into these um, refugee information trackers uh, to be generated into reports for the board of directors. As far as the current donation system, uh, so the process kind of works as following. A donor will come in and they'll record their personal info as well as information about the donation that they're bringing in on a sheet of paper, and then a volunteer will um, go through thousands of sheets of paper of all the donor info and input that into a Google Sheet, and then from that Google Sheet, the system administrator has the task of cleaning that data, um, running analysis on it, and generating reports from it, um, which is a tedious process. So the data going into that system includes the donor info as well as the donation info, which is used to calculate um, donation cost estimates and all three of those things go inside of the data, the database or the Google Sheet. Um, 
which is then used to generate reports, and those reports is given to the board of directors, and the board of directors uses that report to keep track of inventory and also request supplies as needed um, from volunteers. So as you can see, there are five main problems that we're dealing with at Utah Refugee Connection. Um, paper forms, they can get lost, they can be um, written poorly. Second is that volunteers input this data and that um, gets inputted wrong all the time, which leads to a lack of data, um, not normalization. So sometimes there's states that are different, countries are spelled differently, um, these types of things. And then the Google Sheets are, like most other groups have seen, very big, unmanageable, um, and aren't um, able to have data analytics run on them. And so those are the four main systems that are wrong. And the fifth one is that there's no tracking of which refugees receive which um, goods. So you can't see if certain demographic needs a certain home good more than another. And so with our proposed system, we can improve these five areas. Um, so for um, the first proposed, we would, um, for the proposed refugee information system, um, basically, this is an activity gram that walks us through the process of the vision that we have. Um, a refugee will come into this, into the share house with a slip of paper that they've attended that class. If it's their first time, they'll fill out um, on a computer through an application we'll build um, their personal information, and that information will be used to generate a, an ID card of sorts. And then, with that ID card, they'll go to the employee and they will give them that sheet of paper proving that they've attended classes as well as listing the supplies that the refugee needs. And that sheet of paper, the employee will go to the share house, pull the supplies that the refugee needs, and then all the employee needs to do is scan the refugee ID card, and it'll pull up their information, and then scan the um, items as they're given to the refugee, and all of that information will automatically, automatically be populated into a database that we create um, so that that way we'll have the refugee information as well as the donation information hand in hand and we can see which refugees were given what donations. Okay, within the um, new donation system, the changes will be that when the donor comes into the share house, they will be able to use that application form um, to input their donor information and the donation information and that will all be automatically transferred into the um, tracking database. And another really important change is that the, with the barcodes on the donation items, the um, outgoing donation information will be able to be inputted automatically into the donation um, database uh, to be tracked. And the, um, overall, the system will have the ability to have queries done on it so that the system administrator can more easily generate reports to the board of directors. The key part of the whole system we're designing, of course, is the database. Instead of using different Excel sheets, or not even Excel sheets, Google Sheets, um, we designed them a database um, that connects the refugee data and connects the item data so that they can use those and use those to generate real-time reports on their information that they can then use to present to the board of directors. And also, because they are a nonprofit, they have to present their data to the government and the tax information. So this will greatly help improve their process. So next we just have a mock-up of what the dashboard with all of that data is. Um, and that's something that would be part of the system is they could have a data visualization dashboard. But also we just have some mock-ups of the forms themselves that the donors will come in and that they'll fill out and that the refugee will come in and It'll, of course, they'll scan it so it'll automatically get their picture and their name, then they'll put in their classes and then just either put in the items or they can scan those to make the system a lot more efficient. And we are super excited to be able to implement this project with them. And actually, it's kind of funny, a NISM group at BYU contacted them and wanted to create some sort of system like this for their capstone project. And so it'll be a good project that we can just actually give our data to them and they can have some more stuff. Thank you. So did you talk to the NISM group and is there a possibility you might leverage your work? What? Did you talk to the NISM group and is there a possibility you might leverage your work? We have
haven't talked to them yet. We definitely should. Though. But we uh, will give this to them, and I'm sure Utah refugees actually will give it to them. We were there first. So. We were there first. <laughs> so good. Yeah, really. That'd be so good. Good job, you guys.